You know, when most folks think about Israel, the first thing that might pop into their minds is a desert. Fair enough, right? But let me tell you something fascinating. Turns out, we've got the whole shebang of seasons just like the West, complete with chilly winters. Now, picture this, Israelis going bonkers over snow, and guess what, it's finally making its descent in the Galilee for the first time this year. But hold on, there's more to the story. Right now, Israel is buzzing with some incredible happenings. This promised land is getting drenched with not just snow, but also rain, defying the odds. It's like nature's way of throwing the curveball. Rivers are popping up out of nowhere, thanks to some massive rainfall. And here's the kicker, rain in the desert? That's practically a miracle, turning barren landscapes into vibrant life. Before we dive deeper into the current wonders of Israel, Let's hit pause and check out where this sacred land is planted on the globe. Ever heard of Mount Hermon? It's like a celebrity in the Hebrew Bible, marking the northern border of the Promised Land. But it's not just a historical hotspot, it's also Israel's go-to for early warnings. Picture this, a mountain straddling Syria and Lebanon, shouting out warnings like a guardian. And right now, it's all decked out in snow, yeah. Mount Hermon's got its seasonal makeover. Now, here's the cool part. Those snowy peaks play a crucial role in feeding the Jordan River, making it the lifeline of this region. The water journey starts at Mount Hermon, winds through the Sea of Galilee, flows down to the Dead Sea, and dances across the Jordan River. And guess what? The same water magic is happening in the Judean Desert. Rainfall in the Jerusalem area triggers a water show, with rivers popping up and valleys filling up in the blink of an eye. It's like nature's own party, creating life where you least expect it. Now, if you're thinking this sounds like a sneak peek into future events, you're spot on. Let's flip through the pages of the book of Zechariah 14. It talks about a day when the Savior of Israel touches down on the Mount of Olives. Picture this, the mountain splits, a valley forms, and living water starts flowing out of Jerusalem like it's the world's coolest water park. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video, so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell, so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. Zechariah paints a vivid picture. Half of this living water heads to the Dead Sea, and the other half makes its way to the Mediterranean. Now, that's some serious water management. But it doesn't stop there. Everyone's going to know that the God of Israel is the real boss of the earth. The mountain split? Yeah. It's a big deal in Zechariah's vision, creating a spectacle where one part heads north, and the other takes a southern route. Fast forward to Ezekiel's vision in chapter 47. He sees water gushing from the temple in Jerusalem, making a beeline to the Dead Sea. This vision of fresh water sweetening up the salty Dead Sea? It's like turning a science fiction plot into reality. The Jordan Valley? Well, it's in for a makeover, turning into a freshwater lake from Ingeti to a name, making it a sweet spot for fishing. Now, here's the kicker. The Dead Sea, the deepest lake in the world, is about to get a makeover. Fresh water from the Temple at Jerusalem, post Christ's return, is going to sweeten up the salty waters, making them so fresh that fish will happily swim there. Imagine that, turning the Dead Sea into a bustling fish haven. So, what's the secret ingredient here? Mount Hermon, a strategic high ground that's not just a snowy spectacle but a key player in this water symphony. It's like nature's grand orchestra, with the Mount of Olives taking center stage, splitting open to create a water highway. Ezekiel's vision, 
Zechariah's prophecy, it's all coming together like a plot twist in an epic novel. You see, there's something magical about the geography of this sacred land. Mount Hermon, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, they're not just spots on a map. They're characters of the story, playing their part in a grand narrative that spans biblical times to our modern day. And in the heart of it all, the Mount of Olives, standing as a witness to history, waiting for its cue to split open and usher in a wave of transformation. Stay tuned because this story is far from over. There's more to unravel, more to discover in this land where history, prophecy, and nature converge. The Mount of Olives, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, they're not just landmarks, they're pieces of a puzzle that tells a tale of miracles, prophecies, and the ever-unfolding wonders of Israel. Alright, let's dive into the nitty-gritty of the Mount of Olives, a place that's not just a hill, it's a player in some major historical events. Some folks even call it the Mount of Anointment, thanks to its lush olive groves. Yeah, it's got a fancy name, but earned it by being the go-to spot for whipping up olive oil back in the day. Why? Well, they used that liquid gold to anoint the kings and temple priests of Israel. Talk about multitasking, right? Now, rewind the clock, and you'll find King David hoofing it up to the Mount of Olives barefoot, deep in prayer. Why? Well, he was dodging the drama with his son Absalom, and trust me, there were some tears involved, you can check that out in 1 Samuel 15 verse 30. Fast forward a bit, and you've got prophets like Zechariah and Ezekiel prophesying about the fate of Israel, throwing in some future judgment, restoration, and exile regathering for good measure. Hold up, though, Zechariah takes it up a notch. He pinpoints the Mount of Olives as the very spot where the Messiah is making a grand return. You can catch that gem in Zechariah 14 verse 4. And guess who else used this spot for a power prayer move? None other than Jesus himself. Picture this, the day before the big crucifixion showdown, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, pouring his heart out in the Garden of Gethsemane. An angel even swings by for a comfort chat. It's like the ultimate prayer spot for the Messiah. Now, let's fast track to the week leading up to the cross. Jesus is on a Mount of Olives tour, hitting it up three times. First, he rolls down the Mount of Olives on a donkey, fulfilling some ancient prophecy by Zechariah. Then, he's chilling in the Garden of Gethsemane, laying out the lowdown on what's about to go down. Finally, he swings by the Mount of Olives one last time on the betrayal night. Drama much? You betcha. Now, here's the million dollar question. What's the deal with the Mount of Olives? What's its vibe, its essence? Well, buckle up because the Mount of Olives is like a beacon of hope. It's the symbol that screams, hey, Jesus, our savior, is the real MVP yesterday today, and forever. It's the spot where King David faced some tough times, where Jesus prayed, wept, and dropped prophecies like he's predicting the future. Speaking of predictions, let's chat about the Mount of Olives and the Messiah. Jesus rolls in for his first visit, as documented in Luke 19 verses 28 to 39. The crowd's going wild, laying down cloaks, chanting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. It's like a royal parade, and Jesus is soaking it all in. Round 2, Jesus takes a seat with his disciples on the Mount of Olives and spills the beans on the end of day's drama. It's like the ultimate sneak peek into the tribulation and Jesus' second coming. Fast forward to the Passion Week, Jesus is back on the Mount of Olives, praying like his life depends on it. It's the same spot where King David once fled, where Ezekiel and Zechariah dropped their prophetic beats. Talk about coming full circle. But what's the Mount of Olives really about? It's the eternal hope that Jesus, 
the ultimate game changer, will bring peace to Jerusalem and the whole shebang. It's the place where King David faced defeat, where Jesus wept and got betrayed, yet also where he ascended to be with the Father. And guess what? He's making a comeback in style. Now, let's get a bit poetic about it. The Mount of Olives, it's where Jesus kicked off his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's where he answered the disciples' burning questions about the end times. It's where he prayed, taught, and prophesied. It's the spot he chose for his final moments before the ultimate betrayal. And guess what? The Mount of Olives gets a shout out in the ascension and the promise of Jesus' return. Acts 1-2 spill the beans on Jesus ascending to heaven right from the Mount of Olives, and Zechariah 14 verse 14 gives us the lowdown on Jesus coming back to the same spot. Now, let's talk traditions. In the 13th century, pilgrims started a Mount of Olives ritual during the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot. Picture this, folks ascending to the mount, circling the summit in a parade of song and celebration. One circle a day for the first six days, mirroring the temple service where priests circle the altar. Then, on the seventh day, aka Ozan Araba, they pulled out all the stops, circling the summit seven times. It's like a spiritual workout, complete with cries for salvation, save us, Lord, we pray. And here's the twist, while some traditions say Judgment Day is on Yom Kippur, others claim it's Hosanna Rabba when God finalizes his judgment. Imagine this, the Lord stepping onto the Mount of Olives, not just bringing salvation for the believers, but dropping the final judgment mic on everyone. It's a scene straight out of a blockbuster. Now, let's connect the dots. Rain and snow in Israel, why should we care? Well, here's the deal, rain is as rare as a unicorn over the Israeli summer. It's like winning the lottery, and the prayers for rain kick in big time during the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll see signs everywhere, shouting about water shortages and the importance of conservation. Because, my friend, rain and drought in Israel aren't just weather talk, they're spiritual business. Ever wondered why God picked this tiny piece of real estate where the main water source is the Sea of Galilee? Other nations around Israel flood their rivers, Egypt's got the Nile, and the Euphrates does its thing for Mesopotamia. But Israel? It's at the mercy of the skies. God orchestrated it so that his people would have to look up and depend on the big guy upstairs for rain. And guess what? In the Old Testament, God's prophets had a direct line to the heavens. They'd seal up the skies or shout a rain order, and bam, it happened. Drought was the divine punishment, and rain was the heavenly blessing. God wanted to grab Israel's attention, to make them rely on faith and not just take things for granted. He wanted a relationship, not a one-sided deal. Jesus adds a twist to the tale. He reminds us that God's mercy is for everyone, no matter their behavior. Even in the face of Israel's sin and rebellion, God's compassion shines through. Rain becomes not just a physical blessing, but a spiritual one, symbolizing God's kindness to both the righteous and the not-so-righteous. So, why the Mount of Olives? It's not just a hill, it's a message. It's the place. Hey folks, buckle up because Israel's turning into a weather wonderland. Summer just bid us farewell, and guess what rolled in? Snow and rain, my friends. Check out this jaw-dropping footage from Mount Hermon, covered in a thick layer of snow. And if you peek at the weather forecast, more rain and snow are marching right into Israel. But hold on, why is this such a big deal? Well, let me break it down for you. This isn't just any rainfall, it's like a miracle, turning the desert from a dry canvas into a lively masterpiece. 
Imagine rivers popping up out of nowhere, it's a spectacular sight, but also a bit risky. These rivers mean business, they can wipe out roads like they're swatting flies. Now, let's zoom out and understand why this magic is happening. We've got to talk about Israel's geography, and the star of the show is Mount Hermon. Picture this, it's like the water source HQ for Israel. The Golan Heights, controlled by Israel since 67, sits on this mountain. When the snow on top melts, it transforms into water, making its way down to the Sea of Galilee. Speaking of the Sea of Galilee, it's like the epicenter of this aqua journey. Right now, it's sitting at 18 centimeters above what it was on January 28th. Don't get thrown off by the numbers, since the Sea of Galilee is below sea level, the lower, the better. The water from this sea then takes a scenic route, flowing down through the Jordan River, eventually landing in the lowest point on Earth, the Dead Sea. Now, let's talk about the Judean Desert Hills, places like Jerusalem, perched on these hills. When it rains, water cascades down these slopes, making its way into the Judean Desert. But here's the kicker, Israel isn't just sitting back and watching the show. They're putting in serious effort, developing the land, planting crops, and creating reservoirs to turn this territory into a habitable space. Now, here's where it gets biblical, we're talking Zechariah and Ezekiel level. In Zechariah 14, there's this jaw-dropping prophecy about a day when the Savior of Israel stomps onto the Mount of Olives. Picture this, the mountain splits, creating a valley. And get this, living water starts flowing out of Jerusalem, splitting into two, making its way to both the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. It's like a divine waterworks display. And don't think Ezekiel's left out of the party. He spills the beans on a special temple, a game-changer in the Messianic era. From this temple, a river flows, hitting up the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean. If you're itching for more on this, I've got episodes delving into the Ezekiel Temple. Check the links in the description. Now, I know what you're thinking. This sounds like something out of a sci-fi novel. But here's the kicker. We're getting a taste of it now. When Israel transforms the desert into farmlands, it's like a sneak peek into what this ultimate river from Jerusalem will do. It's a game changer, turning the whole region into a lush paradise. So, as we witness the rain and snow transforming Israel, let's dream a bit. Imagine a future where there are no more wars, no more pain, and no more suffering. The Messiah ruling the earth, bringing eternal peace to everyone. That's the dream, and I hope you enjoyed this ride through Israel's weather wonders. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.